it is another example, I think, of how the U.S. is now going to be behind other countries where, you know, U.S. citizens aren't even able to access the same assets that people are in other places. And we don't even know why. Like, we don't even know if there is a principal basis for that reason, you know, for that distinction. This content is brought to you by Uphold, which is one of the top crypto platforms in the industry. I've been a user of this platform for many years, so I can vouch for them. They have 260 plus cryptocurrencies, and best of all, they are secure and safe. They have a transparency report that you can go review. They are 100% reserved. They don't commingle or lend out your funds, and they just launched an amazing new product where you can earn up to 5% APY on your USD balance. So picture this, you take profits on your crypto trades. You now have the US dollars. You can leave it on uphold and earn a great return. And here are the key features of this product, folks. There's no lockups. You can go in and out at any time. And it is FDIC insured, folks. FDIC insured up to $2.5 million for participating funds. And there are no monthly fees. So This is a great service and I will be leveraging this and this product once again just launched so you can check it out folks and earn on your profit taking that uh, you do from your crypto trading. So incredible stuff. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold and this new great service, visit the link in the description. Welcome into the Thinking Crypto Podcast. I'm your host, Tony Edward, and with me today is Amanda Tuminelli, who's the Chief Legal Officer at the DeFi Education Fund. Amanda, great to see you. Great to have you back on. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be back. So, Amanda, you testified at the Congressional DeFi hearing that took place, I believe, was last week. Uh, Great job. And it was amazing to see Congress holding a a hearing about DeFi. I feel like we've come so far. Uh, What was the goal of that hearing and what were some takeaways for you? Uh, Well, first, thank you for the kind words. And it was really great to see Congress hold a hearing about DeFi. It was the first one that was exclusively focused on DeFi. And the point was to engage with the reality of the technology, to learn about DeFi, to um, you know, have that symbolic moment of Congress actually engaging directly with the industry that they are trying to learn about. So we definitely were thrilled that they noticed that hearing and wanted us to speak at it. And I was lucky to sit next to some really talented and smart experts in the space. Yeah, I saw some clips. Uh, there, there, there seems to be some naysayers, um, you know, some members of Congress who are, you know, trying to. Uh, paint DeFi or crypto in a negative light, but overall there was some uh, positive takeaways and it's great that we're having the dialogue so that maybe this is a start to get us to legislation, right? Yeah, I think this is this has to be the starting point, right? Like actually trying to learn about what DeFi is and how it works and why it's valuable has to be the starting point before members of Congress seek to regulate it or legislate about it. Of course, not everybody was there uh, to learn and really just some people just wanted to make their points on why they think we're all criminals. But (laughs) we expected that. And honestly, it was better than expected. Like, truly, I I think um, we were prepared to answer much more difficult questions if we needed to. And I think it actually did show that generally everybody was really trying to, you know, do like have this good this first hearing in good faith. Mm. And it, it, I don't know if you can, if you agree with this, but it seems like um, the number of people who are pro crypto are starting to outweigh those who are anti crypto due to a- advocacy, education, look lobbying as well from the industry. It seems the the tide is changing. You still have your naysayers, your detractors, but for the most part, I think uh, many are uh, on both sides of the aisle are, are ready to embrace this technology. So you're saying we're winning. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I I think you're right. I think that I even, um, you know, anecdotally, right, like even in my friends and family, I feel like the sentiment about crypto has been changing since I took this job a year and a half ago. Um, so I agree with you. There is definitely a shift happening. And I think it's because there are a ton of people building in this space, developing projects and doing so in a way that it like is fundamentally good and valuable and not, and like those voices are being heard more and more. Mm. Um, I don't know if you can answer this. Are, are there plans to have a round two of this maybe next year? 
Oh, I truly don't know. I hope so. Like, I would assume that there would be more hearings about DeFi just based on um, past patterns of how Congress treats this kind of thing. But there's nothing that I know of right now um, in the works. There are other hearings happening um, right now yeah. um, about the SEC, uh, their regulation by enforcement. All five commissioners will be in front of Congress soon. So there are other hearings happening that I think we're all very interested in. Yeah, to your point, uh, one happening uh, today, there's a couple next week, Chair Gensler is going to be at one, then they're all five commissioners. I'm actually really excited for that. And I, I you know, I want to see what, what it's going to be like, because on one side of the SEC, Hester, Purse, Marky, Ueda, they have a different view on crypto than uh, Gensler and the other two Democrat uh, uh, commissioners. So I, I don't know how, uh, how much fireworks there's going to be, but uh, hopefully it's a good dialogue. I know. I can't remember how long it's been since the last time, but I think it's been a few years since all five sat there uh, at the same table. And like you said, it will definitely be interesting. They are going to have a range of things to say in response to member questions. For sure. Now, you know, Amanda, I thought the SEC was done, you know, attacking crypto. And look, I they have a job to do. They have to stop bad actors and scammers. We're not, we're not, you know, pushing back against that. But we see the the sometimes unlawful attack against certain companies that are legitimately just trying to do business. And the SEC hit the ground running after the summer break, uh, issuing a Wells notice against OpenSea, claiming that NFTs on their platform are securities. Uh, SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce issued a dissent on this. Uh, what are your thoughts on this situation? Yeah, so unfortunately, I don't think the SEC is stopping its campaign against this industry. Um, so as you mentioned, the OpenSea announced that they had received a Wells notice. Um, I don't believe the actual um, details of the Wells notice are out there other than just like the claim that NFTs are securities. And, um, you know, I think it's great that there has been this trend of people making public that they've received a Wells notice because it's important to call attention to the fact that the SEC is unduly focused on crypto projects, NFT projects. Um, and, you know, the this is not the first time the SEC has targeted an NFT project. There's obviously, you know, at least two past actions that we can that, you know, we know of. And there's the re recent lawsuit of the NFT industry fighting back and actually suing the SEC. So Jonathan Mann and Brian Fry, who are both NFT creators, sued the SEC for like the exact opposite implication, right? That NFTs are not securities. Um, and that case is definitely going to be one to watch because in that, um, also, if you haven't read the complaint, it's just a very fun complaint to read. Um, Jason Gottlieb and Morrison Cohen represents them and he himself is a musician. So I feel like this this really aligned with his also personal passions in addition to just you know excellent work in the industry but um as the complaint explains like art um should not be considered even if it is released in the form of an nft should not be considered a security this empowers you know nfts empower artists to sell their work in a way that actually makes money for them directly and why should they not be able to you know earn royalties on that and control the ownership over their art so i i think that Though the SEC, you know, may at some point decide to take action against OpenSea, we don't know. It's early in the early in the process when you receive a Wells. They'll at least be fighting the opposite implication um, in this pre-enforcement challenge. I love that the industry is going on the offensive. Like you said, there everyone is coming out and saying, hey, we got a Wells notice. So the SEC is doing this, putting it out in the open. And like you said, uh, folks are proactively launching uh, lawsuits and, and things along those lines. Uh, it's kind of like punch, punching back against the bully a bit. And uh, I'm really happy to see the industry do that. Because years ago, I, I remember when Ripple got sued, everyone everyone kind of ran to their corners like, let's see what's going to happen, right? But now everyone is in the open and like, hey, we're going to fight back in court. Absolutely. And, you know, that's something that we're doing at DEF too. We have our airdrop case, which I know we talked about in the past, um, where, you know, we're we sued the SEC along with our co-plaintiff saying that we would like a declaration that airdrops, free airdrops are not securities transactions. So there's that. There's the Legilex case, um, which is, you know, asking the court to declare that a digital trading platform in the form of Legilex's uh, digital trading platform is not a securities exchange. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a number of these, and I think there will be more.
Yeah. Um, with regards to the airdrops, I saw yesterday Congressman Tom Emmer and Patrick McHenry sent a letter, <clears throat> excuse me, to the SEC uh, asking for clarity around crypto airdrops. And that's a big thing because I, I won't disclose the name of the project, but I was trying to work with someone with a game that would do an airdrop. And guess what? Their legal team is so worried that they're like, hey, we can't do it. We can't do it. Even though there's no investment, there's there's no trading of the token. It's just an airdrop that you can use in the game to buy skins and so forth. Uh, but there's no like trading in the open market. They're still scared because they don't know if the SEC is going to come after them. And rightfully so. You know, I understand that take. There is, it, it should not be the case that a free airdrop is considered um, an investment contract. There is no investment of money right. by definition. Um, but because the SEC has done such a poor job regulating the space and has been so inconsistent and given absolutely no proactive prospective guidance to the industry, of course, that, you know, projects have to worry that if they do a free air drop, that they'll be targeted next. That is, you know, the reason why we brought our suit. Yeah. Now, Hester Purse's dissent, I would love to get your take on that. Um, it was pretty fiery. <laughs> um, and I love that she's doing this as well. What was your take on her dissent? Yeah, I mean, she's never boring, right? It's um, it, was, <laughs> it was a great uh, read. In addition to making good, good legal points, it was also just fun to read. Um, and I think that it evidences that like, there's even people at the SEC who themselves don't agree with the way that the commission has been regulating the space. But so in, in that um, in that dissent, she makes clear their NFTs were also an issue there. She mm. makes clear that in with these facts where the NFT would entitle the holder to access to a, I think it was a private membership club or restaurant and the NFT got you access and possibly, um, I don't know if it was like a discount or something, but like got you into the restaurant and you still would then have to pay for everything that you order when you get there. Um, she makes clear that like that type of NFT is not, a, that's not an investment contract. Wow. Yeah, of course you could resell your NFT. Like she makes the point, if you leave town and you don't live close to this club anymore and you want to resell your NFT, like, of course you want the option to get out of that private membership, but that, um, that doesn't make your NFT a security. And she uses just like the most fun color colorful language. I really enjoyed her saying at the end, I think she said something like people should be able to experiment with NFTs without consulting a high price tea leaf reader, ahem, a lawyer. Um, and I, I, you know, like I appreciate the jab, like, you know, it's, as I said to Congress, like there are people with decades of experience giving legal advice in this space and they cannot tell their clients with certainty whether their projects comply with the law. Like that's just the reality. It's ridiculous. And I think about, look, I grew up trading uh, baseball cards, basketball cards and so forth and comic books. And and I think, OK, if I got a LeBron James rookie card and am I entering into a contract with LeBron James if the value goes up because he's a great basketball player and I resell that card for a profit? It's just ridiculous. It's I, I just don't get it where they're coming from with this. No, that's the exact right analogy. I mean, the collectible space would be next, right? I mean, I don't know if that's where the SEC would go, but applying the logic that the SEC is using to digital assets, collectibles would therefore then be investment contracts. So I I mean, there it seems like their view is literally anything that you spend money on or even receive for free that you expect to go up in value is an investment contract. And that's just way broader than any reasonable definition of a security and also expands their authority way beyond what Congress, um, you know, has said their authority is. So, yeah, uh, hopefully we can get some legislation through. I saw yesterday Patrick McHenry, I think he was speaking at some uh, event and he said he's hoping that during the lame duck session, they could potentially push, I don't know if the Fit 21 bill or a different version of it through the Senate. Uh, Chuck Schumer, I think about a month ago at the Crypto for Harris town hall live stream said, He's willing to work uh, to get this through. So we got some support on both sides of the aisle and hopefully can get clarity soon and we don't have to wait another two years. But if not by the end of this year, maybe early next year. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we absolutely applaud the efforts of members of Congress to spend time on this, to try to figure out the right way forward. I think it's going to be really tough to 
pass anything during the lame duck, of course. Um, but you know, it's it's I I think the attention to it is important. And I think next Congress we probably will see something. You know, we will see some bill make it. Hmm. Now there was another uh settlement or case with the SEC against eToro. I wish eToro fought back, but they settled and uh, I think they're only allowed to trade Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash and Ethereum in the United States now, but they uh, didn't uh, adhere or didn't agree to that they did anything wrong and they're now they're leaving or they're taking a lot, a big part of their business overseas. What are your thoughts on that settlement? So I, I hear you and I relate to the feeling of like, oh, you know, like I wish that they were able to fight this off, but I also like do not begrudge any project in this space who um, doesn't want to spend the time, resources or risk mm -hmm. the outcome of an enforcement action actually going to court. Um, it takes millions of dollars and potentially years in court to reach a resolution on the actual enforcement action if the SEC files. So I get it. I think that, you know, when you're running a business, you have to make that call. And I don't begrudge them that at all. I do wish the SEC would issue orders that were actually helpful because now we have an order that was, you know, relatively short and doesn't provide guidance to the industry, right? Like, I feel like we're always saying the same things. And that's not on eToro, that's on the SEC. Like, they're the ones who are going to draft this order and put it out there and then point to it, right? Like, they will point to it later and say, like, look, we, you know, like you should be able to glean from these settlement orders what we're doing in this space and how we are regulating. But the order doesn't say anything. Like, how did they arrive at Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash and Ethereum? I know, like we can try to cobble together their past arguments on that. But what about all the other tokens yeah. that were at issue? We now have no guidance on a, on any of those other tokens as what as to what the SEC thinks they are. We don't know if the SEC thinks they're all securities um, or not. So it's just another example of the SEC regulating by enforcement and not actually giving helpful guidance to the space. Yeah, because like if you're looking at the consensus consensus mechanism, you know, is it proof of work? All proof of work tokens are not securities. Well, what about Dogecoin and Litecoin? Why didn't you include those? Uh, it, with Ethereum, is it all uh, proof of stake tokens are not securities? Well, what about Avalanche? What about Cardano? Like, it's there's no logic here. It's just whatever Gary Genser and these people are thinking in their heads. Exactly. Um, and, you know, I I assume now that eToro, I think if I remember correctly, eToro is going to just have those other tokens still available for trade just outside the United States. Right. And it is another example, I think, of how the U.S. is now going to be behind other countries where, you know, U.S. citizens aren't even able to access the same assets that people are in other places. And we don't even know why. Like, we don't even know if there is a principled basis for that reason, you know, for that distinction. So, OK, so, Amanda, um, for the DeFi Education Fund, what else do you guys have on your roadmap uh, for the remainder of the year and going into 2025? So we are uh, gearing up to do another round of amicus briefs. Um, we're going to put a brief in support in of Pert Sev's appeal. So that's the Tornado Cash software developer who's in the Netherlands. Um, you know, he was convicted on the, the trial court level and um, he's now appealing. And what's interesting is in the Netherlands, an appeal is actually a complete redo. So like unlike here where the record is you know, limited to what happened below. In the Netherlands, it's a complete redo. You can do the facts again. You can bring in experts again. So we're going to work with Coin Center um, to put an amicus brief into that case, um, which we're working on right now. We are um, considering whether we're going to put an amicus brief into the Samurai Wallet case, also in that case to, to highlight the completely inconsistent position that the DOJ has taken versus the 2019 FinCEN guidance as to what constitutes a money services business. I think that that is um, a really problematic trend, and I hope it is not a trend, but it, it seems like it may be a trend that the DOJ um, is just saying the 2019 guidance that the industry followed for years is just guidance, and they don't have to... Um, pay any attention to it and can charge cases however they see fit, even if people were acting in good faith and following that guidance. So I think that's an issue that's really important that we want to speak on. Mm -hmm. um, and 
We'll, of course, be eyes open for any efforts in Congress to work on a market structure bill. We, you know, we will continue educating members of Congress on DeFi and hopefully getting to do more DeFi demos with those who, you know, may be DeFi skeptical. Mm. So that's uh, that's the immediate road ahead. And then our cases on, you know, we our impact litigation cases are ongoing. So we have that Bebe case we talked about earlier, which is the airdrop case. We are opposing the motion to dismiss mm. in the next couple of months. And we uh, may have more cases to file soon. And I will tell you when I can tell you more about them. Well, I definitely want to have you back on when those go live. Um, but I appreciate all the great work you guys are doing and uh, helping the industry. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for joining me, Amanda. Thank you for having me. It was great to be back on.